Uh, thanks, Scott, and it's uh, good to be back. And I think uh, uh, Scott didn't mention it, but uh, I updated this thing just for you. So if somebody wanted to tweet, you're welcome to tweet. Is so I just don't want to hear the bird sounds, I guess. Um, okay, so uh, my, my goal for you is to review a little bit of the kind of the current concepts, uh, certain new thoughts uh, regarding meniscus pathology. I think uh, many of us in the room certainly have taken care of patients with, uh, patients with knee pain, patients with meniscus, but there's been a significant change in terms of the pendulum about a few different topics about meniscus treatment and understanding where they're at right now and why we got there and perhaps what that means for the future is going to be important. So in terms of any disclosures, uh, I don't, I, no, no company pays me for anything, so anything I say here is, is kind of pretty sh my, my, my own opinion for you. So I want to start off with the concept of a pendulum of knowledge. So what, how does this work? You have a foundational knowledge. This is what you kind of know. It's usually the, the factual things. It's the anatomy uh, for most of us regarding the meniscus. Then somebody comes up with some innovative thought or some discovery. They get anecdotal support. And then it becomes common, accepted, it becomes dogma. So that's how we start practice. That's that we just go from that old-fashioned dogma. Somewhere along the path, uh, somebody then comes up with a new idea, maybe a new technology, some, it challenges the foundation. And then so from that, you start doing experimental testing, validation, if it's real or not. And then there's aggressive implementation of this new thought. But sometimes the quality of that research wasn't so great, so the pendulum goes one way and then starts coming back the other. And ultimately, you get a bigger picture assessment. We look at large populations and outcome studies. Uh, and uh, then we try to create a balanced position to the problem. And what we end up doing is we create a new dogma, new idea, that we get kind of get grounded in fact until somebody else comes up with a new idea and it swings around again. So that's what I think we see a variety of aspects in terms of meniscus pathology. So let's go with our found foundational knowledge. What do we really know? Uh, well, it com meniscus comes from the word uh, meniscus, which means the lunar crescent uh, by, by description. It's type 1 fibrocartilage. It has a low uh, water content. And its nutrition is generally by diffusion, which means just joint nutrition from the, the lubricant uh, surfaces, as well as some from the periphery. So this is foundational knowledge. Other things that we know in terms of the meniscus, and I think it becomes important in terms of all of our treatment, is form follows function. So what is, what's it shaped, how is it built? And these are the facts and the foundations that will never change. And one of them, it's wedge shaped in its cross section, which means it's actually gonna serve as a chalk block. It's gonna serve as a secondary restraint to ligamentous stability for ACLs and PCL function. The surface of the, of the, of the meniscus, the collagen is actually randomly oriented. And actually that's really good because as they interlink in a random fashion, as you shear the hyaline cartilage against it, it keeps it intact. So that tangential fibers becomes very important. In the periphery, uh, we have radial tie fibers, so things that are going from uh, in deep inside to, to the periphery. And these actually connect the meniscus to the periphery, which actually maintain the vascular attachments, also very important in terms of structure. And then, then really, probably most of us, if we look about the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the basic f construction of the meniscus, is these hoop fibers. So most of the fibers are circumferential, circling around the meniscus. This is going to be important in terms of thinking about our, our, our fixation of these, uh, of, of these tears, because when you lose the hoop, hoop functions, then that's when people have lose the function of the meniscus. And part of that circumferential fiber wouldn't be just, say, a radial tear that cut through the fibers. If you lose the roots, you actually lose the function of the entire meniscus. So the lateral meniscus tends to be more mobile than medial. Why do we need to know that? On physical examination, when you're doing your McMurray's and you're doing your studies, oftentimes you're going to feel a little click or a pop or some, some movement on the lateral side that you won't feel on the medial side. That's not abnormal. So remember on your examinations to look for meniscus pathology, you're looking for mechanical pathology of the meniscus. You actually not only want to feel a click or clunk or some type of mechanical pathology, you need to feel pain at the same time, particularly laterally, to call it a positive exam. In terms of the other functions, we talked about this shape. It's the shape, uh, with the, the, really the functional goal of this meniscus is a little bit of this chalk block back and forward, but actually is matching the shape of the flat tibial plateau to the round femoral condyle. So we know that intact, um, uh, compared to a loss of a meniscus, you have 10 times surface contact area. So the surface contact, because everything's nice and connected, it actually absorbs the shock better. 
you transfer loads across the highland cartilage. You transfer loads to the tibia and femur because it shares a load because it has a, a broader surface contact area. Losing the meniscus, now you have increased focal pressures because you don't have, it's not match shaped anymore. So you have the round femoral condyle hitting the femoral, femoral, uh, femoral condyle. So basically this is what you get. You get these, this, these forces where on the right or on your left, uh, uh, you see that it actually is sharing the forces. The, up, the, the, the axial loads are being shared because the meniscus is in place. On the right, when you lose the meniscus, all the forces start focusing into the middle. Now I will tell you that I actually, uh, uh, how, how do you transfer this information to your patient? You know, you, you tell them all this stuff, they have to understand loss of their meniscus is important or not. Well, I have a simple way to do this. So what I do is this, I, you, I actually this, I take the, have the patient put out their own hand. So you put out your hand, okay, and I have them make a little cup. Make a little cup, and I put my own hand in the little cup. I go, that's, that's your tibial plateau, that's your tibial plateau with the meniscus, and here's your femoral condyle. And I kind of push down on them, and they go, okay, yeah, so yeah, no big deal. I go, okay, now make your hand flat. Make your hand flat, and then I'm going to actually put my, and I kind of cheat here, I actually make my knuckle a little bit bigger, and then I focus right on their, their palm, and I push down, and they go, ouch, that hurts a little bit. I go, that's why you get arthritis. That's because you, when you lose meniscus function, you, you ultimately increase that focal load. Interestingly for this pe pendulum, a single picture can redirect the pendulum. So who's seen this picture before? All the orthopods in the front row have seen it. This is actually considered to be the most reproduced picture in all of sports medicine. It actually comes from Steve Arnosky from the Hospital of Special Surgery, and it's actually, it's a lucky picture. It's one of those lucky discoveries. They're actually studying ACLs at the time. They're uh, putting India ink, eye, India, India ink dye into the, into the knees to see the vascularity of the, knee, of the knee, but particularly the ligaments. They threw away a bunch of slides, and somebody goes, well, I don't know why we threw, away those, we threw away those slides. Let's go look at those again. And this was one of those slides, because they weren't, they weren't looking at the meniscus, but what they ended up learning is that the vascularity of the meniscus comes from the peripheral third, okay? Becomes really important in terms of our treatment function, or treatments for our, our meniscus because now we know it's repairable. You need the, actually this vascularity for potential repairability. And that single picture changed the way we, way we thought about meniscus and potential treatments. So original meniscal dogma, in all honesty, meniscus was vestigial, meant nothing. It was like an appendix. You can take it out, no big deal. Well, actually, Fairbanks actually showed us that was not true at all. So we knew that when you lost meniscus, lost all the function, you had an increased pro uh, uh, progression of arthritis uh, significantly in the future. Now, that was a relatively low-level study at the time, but it was still pendulum changing. It changed, changed the, the thought because now we knew we had to save the meniscus. And so ultimately then, the whole concept becomes for the next decades is save the meniscus, save the meniscus. So, the question then is, where are you on the pendulum? 12-year-old female basketball player, 14 months post menarche positive Lachman, positive pivot shift, positive McMurray's, MRI scan shows peripheral medial meniscus tear. What do you want to do for her? Wait for maturity so her ACL gets better and her physis close? Do just a meniscus repair, meniscectomy, or ACL and meniscus? You got to vote. One, two, three, four. So those of you that are gutsy enough to vote, most of you are voting for four, which is, is absolutely right. The, 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 the standard of care right now is save the meniscus. This is, a 12, this is a young lady. We want to save the meniscus. And so this is some of her MRI scan pictures. And you can see the peripheral meniscus tear. She had a dysfunctional ACL. And so despite the fact that she, had an, uh, 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 she was open vices, we knew that we needed to save the meniscus do a repair and do the ACL at the same time. It was, in all honesty, if it was just ACL, you might wait to see how things go. But because the meniscus, we needed to save the meniscus, we need to stabilize the need to do that. So what are some of the repair outcomes? Well, this is a study by Crike in, in, uh, in 2014, and a few different things that he, they, they found. One is further meniscus damage if you don't fix the ACL. So although this gal had one meniscus tear, if you didn't treat her, she's probably gonna tear up the other meniscus tear over time. We actually have better success rates with our repairs if we repair with an ACL, if we do the ACL at the same time. It stabilizes the knee, but there's something about the marrow cells that get released that actually improve the meniscus healing. There are better outcomes if it's in the peripheral third. 
So again, if you have that, in, that increased vascularity that Steve Arnosky showed us out in the periphery, the farther out peripherally it goes, the better they're going to heal. And that's what you can see in Crike's study. If it's within three millimeters of the rim, much higher healing rate than if it's uh, greater than three millimeters. And then lastly, and this becomes fairly logical, if it's a simple vertical bucket handle tear, they're going to have a much higher success rate than a complex tear that's ripped in two or three different directions. This is, a, this is an interesting slide, lots of noise, but I'm gonna, we'll, we'll walk through it. Basically what it's doing, it's, it's, looking, it's reviewing several different studies in terms of how, how do people do regarding their meniscus uh, repairs with and without ACL reconstructions. And what we see in the green, all of the greens are the ones where they did an ACL at the same time they did the meniscus repair. And then they assess the success of the meniscus. What did we find? 93% success of the meniscus healing if you did the ACL at the same time. Either complete or partial goes up to 94% if you add both of those together if you do the ACL. If you don't do the ACL, and this is actually the knee was stable, I just tore the meniscus, only 63 to 73%. So there's significant changes that occur when you do an ACL at the same time. So it's, it, it improves the potential healing uh, uh, by doing the ACL. So now, with that said, can ACL reconstruction actually prevent potential meniscus injury? Well, that's actually also been true. We know in young kids that the more that they play on an unstable knee, they're going to beat up more things. This is a study uh, from, um, from Sanders in 2016. Basically, what he showed is that non-op treatment of an ACL deficient knee increases the risk of developing a meniscus tear by five times. Non-op treatment uh, increases the risk of development of OA by six times and ultimately over time, a 16-time risk of getting a total knee arthroplasty. So clearly, current concepts, current state of the pendulum uh, for uh, what do you do for acute repairable tears in athletes is to save the meniscus and stabilize the knee. Now one challenge here, now this is now our technological challenge, a new push in the pendulum. That, that, that last standard, save the meniscus, stabilize the knee, pretty much standard of care. Everybody kind of understands that and we've been doing that for a while. But what's a repairable meniscus? I just told you that vertical peripheral one is the classic repairable one. That's the one we're gonna, that we want to treat if at all possible. However, so this longitudinal vertical peripheral, maybe a bucket handle tear, those are the ones that are repairable. But how about a radial tear? Vascularity is out here. How about a horizontal tear? Vascularity is out here. It doesn't split into there. What are we supposed to do about those? Or even a potentially a root tear? So here's some inter interesting new studies uh, regarding radial meniscus tears. So this is not something that we classically would have addressed. So if you learned about it in your patient, said that there was a, uh, was a radial tear on MRI scan, most of the time we would have just trimmed it out if it was symptomatic. But here's two studies that actually show that using a repairable novel device or with pull-out sutures, so you just basically repair that, repair that radial tear side to side as best you can, they have decreased contact forces. So actually, it decreases that focal load by actually trying to repair part of the, uh, the, radial, the radial meniscus. And in fact, uh, uh, in the cadaver study, an acute radial tear, putting it back together and then rechecking the forces that Laprade did, they actually showed that they can improve the joint mechanics almost back to an intact state. At this point, both of these studies, cadaver studies, interesting, but we really don't know what the long-term healing is in terms of uh, 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 potential healing over time. How about horizontal tears? So these are the ones that everybody says, oh, now I've got the older person, they have a degenerative horizontal cleavage tear uh, in, in their meniscus. It splits sideways. So what are we supposed to do about those? Well, this study actually shows that the horizontal cleavage tear increases peak contact forces. My knuckle again, peak, peak contact forces increase if, if you just have a horizontal cleavage tear. That's not good. It also reduces the effective contact area, same thing, uh, because, because we've lost it. And so the, what happens, though, with the repair, if you can actually stick these things together side by side, you can actually improve your contact area to within about 15% of baseline. So because of that, people have actually now started to do a sandwich technique where they'll put some PRP or something inside and then sandwich the two things together without resecting one of the top or bottom leaves of the meniscus. Long-term outcomes of that, I think we don't really know again, but, it, but I think it's something that we have to worry about. How about meniscus root tears? Meniscus root tears, 
Now we've talked about these circumferential fibers and you need the root attachments to maintain the, the circumferential to uh, uh, allow the, the, the hoop stresses so that you don't actually load. Root tears, if you completely tear one root all the way off, you need to know it's like cutting the meniscus in half, a complete radial tear. It completely dysfunctions the meniscus. So how about what, what happens if we do a root repair? And we started to do these, we put some stitches in them, you grab it down through the tibia and repair it back down. So is it something you should be looking for and identifying in our patients? Well, guess what? Seems to have some benefit. It improves the Lysholm sco scores, and 82% had no DJD progression at three years. So both of these are good things. However, when you actually go back and look at the current root repair techniques that we do, and it may be that we're gonna have better techniques in the future, they didn't have a lot of complete healing. Only 60% actually had complete healing, and many of them still had extrusion. Extrusion means that that meniscus is actually squirted out to the side and it's not actually in between the joint anymore, so it's not actually matching the shape anymore. So if it extrudes, it's not functioning. Uh, so what do we need to have? We need to think about longer-term outcomes, better techniques potentially, but clearly trying to repair these root tears, especially acutely, is going to be important. We just need to know how to be able to do them well. Now, another question that I had, this is a question I actually was challenged with a few years ago is why are we getting arthritis after ACLs, PCLs, and IM nailing? But particularly my question was why, why do we have an increased risk of arthritis after ACLs? And in fact, hot off the presses, we're talking hot, this is, this is October of 2017, this is this week, uh, 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 American Journal of Sports Medicine, uh, Laprade looked at, looked at or did a retrospective review of about uh, 40 different studies, 4,000 patients, uh, and what they found was that at five years after ACL reconstruction, 11% of the patients had degenerative changes in the knee. At 10 years, 21%, and at 20 years, 50%. So my question is, is why is that? Is that just because they actually damaged their knee because of the ACL? What's, what's going on? And so actually I challenged one of my residents, and actually they went and did lab studies with, uh, with Rob, and what I was asking is, is, are we damaging something iatrogenically at the time of surgery? Are we doing damage? And if actually, I think we potentially are. So this is a footprint of the ACL, okay? This is the footprint of the PCL. And somewhere around here, some maybe a little bit anterior, maybe right down in here, this is the footprint if you do an IM rod. Putting, you know, somebody broke their tibia, you're putting a rod down. You sit there and go, okay, we're kind of in the middle of the notch, is that okay? But look how close that gets to the anterior medial root. Look how, look how close, uh, uh, if, you, if you rip through the intermeniscal ligament anteriorly, you can damage both of the, uh, the roots of the anterior lateral and anterior medial meniscus. PCL, if you kind of misplace it medial laterally, it gets awful close to the roots in the back. So this was a, this was a concern of mine in terms of how you do it, so I sent John Watson to work with Rob, and then what we did is we did these studies in, in, uh, uh, in knees, and in cadaver knees, and we decided if, if you put a 40-degree approach angle on the tibial, for your tibial ACL reconstruction, or a 60-degree angle, and what are we potentially damages? 66% 66, 66 of the knees had some injury to the anterior lateral root of the meniscus. 27% of the footprint. Now, not all of it, it didn't take it all down, but it certainly potentially weakened it. 50% of the knees, with it at a 40 degree angle, which is a little bit more, it's actually more near the classic angle for ACL reconstructions, actually had a medial root injury about 8.6% of the time, but actually if you dropped and made that more vertical, you had less risk of, of, of a root tear. So clearly that study motivated Rob and his lab group to actually do more studies. And actually he recruited his son, uh, Chris, he recruited his other son, Matt, and they did some other studies with PCLs and IM rods, both of which show that we're actually potentially risking part of the root anchors by doing these procedures. So we have to be careful, and potentially in the future, and it may be that soft tissue reconstructions like Philippe is doing may be slightly a better advantage of what I do, which is a BTB graft, which may have a bigger tunnel. So smaller tunnels, very appropriately placed tunnels, may be what we need to be thinking about. Another thing that I've strongly been considering, and we started doing in the lab, as in a lab test, is if I'm losing 27% of my footprint, what I've been doing in the lab, haven't been doing it in patients yet, I'm now seeing if I can put stitches into the anterior horn, and when I tug down on my ACL reconstruction, I'm re-repairing my partial injury 
of my, of my root. Just because I know now, it probably damaged some of it. We'll see if that plays out. So the next swing of the pendulum uh, is foundational challenges uh, for some, uh, some other foundational challenges is not what was repairable, but what is restorable. So we actually lose the meniscus. What other things can you do to potentially save the meniscus or actually rebuild it or reconstruct it or make a brand new one? You gotta be careful in, on these, uh, in these pendulums because not every swing is gonna work. And that's particularly true as we look for some of these augmenting issues. So augmenting issues, you could potentially do some biologic injection, like mesenchymal stem cells. You can make a new, brand new scaffold. You can consider transplantation. But let's see actually, with those pressures, where the pendulum is and whether it's going to be a, a, a wise thing for us to do universally at this point. So the magic of mesenchymal stem cells. Clearly, it's an exciting idea. The idea is I can go to some basic mesenchymal stem cell, which is a pluripotential cell, I squirt it in, and it magically creates whatever I want it to create, whether it's fibrocartilage, hyaline cartilage, or whatever else we want it to be. So how about, what are the outcomes with that? Well, it certainly seems for cartilage, hyaline cartilage, it's better than PRP. It has a multi-lineage plasticity, and numerous studies have confirmed some regeneration capability for articular cartilage. But what about the meniscus? That's really what, what this talk is supposed to be about. In 2008, Centino actually said, well, I think it's going to have a big effect on the meniscus. So he took mesenchymal stem cells, squirted them inside the knee, and then did repetitive MRI scans to see if that's going to change anything. And he actually felt, at least in the single case report, very anecdotal, that he actually had increased meniscal volume. Increased meniscal volume. Pay attention to that because that's what, that's, that seems to be the measure at least of these studies with mesenchymal stem cells that were making a difference. I'm not sure if it's the way to make the measure because we don't know what that quality of that tissue is. But here's a study by PAC or a couple studies, also relatively small case reports. Basically, they squirted uh, mesenchymal stem cells in. Uh, these were from adipose tissue followed by PRP. And again, follow-up MRI scan. He suggested that they had increased meniscal volume. Another study by PAC, uh, larger group. So Notice that there's a couple of guys that are doing a lot of this. Now he's got 91 patients. Again, uh, MRI evidence of meniscal regeneration volume. <coughs> but the problem is, again, are we biased with this author? It's unblinded. It's anecdotal. But it's kind of exciting. So uh, we want to think about, is it possible? This is probably a better study. It was a level one evidence study by Van Ness and uh, uh, Farr. Farr does a lot of cutting edge cartilage research. And so he's somebody I would look for in the, in the literature to see if things are really true or not. Uh, what they did is they had a randomized double-blind placebo control study, now reasonably quality evidence, 55 evidence, 55 patients with 50% partial meniscectomies treated with mesenchymal stem cells, triple density mesenchymal stem cells, or placebo. And what they found was that the mesenchymal stem cells improved their, their pain scores, or their, the VAS scores and Lysholme scores, and they both showed, again, back to our MRI, uh, improved meniscal volume uh, uh, regeneration at one year. My challenge is, <coughs> when I look at some of these studies that they picture, I'm not sure if I can count on if left and right is increased meniscal volume. I don't, I'm not sure if it's the same quality of MRI. I'm not sure if it's the same cut on the MRI that I'm making those measures. Or here, in terms of now, let's make it, they're, they're arguing here that the picture on the right has better quality tissue than the tissue on the left, except it's a different, qual it's a different uh, uh, MRI scan. And so, so it's showing different things. So I still don't know if what, we, what we're going to get from mesenchymal stem cells. I do believe they, they, they appear to show that they have uh, some improvement in terms of elimination of symptoms. I don't think it actually reproduces function at this point. We have no documentation that prevents arthritis. We don't have any documentation that's durable. It is low risk, it's fairly simple, it's fairly expensive, but probably less expensive than a total joint, so something that could be considered. How about scaffolds? Instead of squirting cells in, we're going to put some type of a matrix in there that hopefully new cells will grow onto uh, and become the meniscus. This actually was originally FDA approved in the United States in 2008. The FDA said, no, nope, you can't do it anymore, and then in 2015, they said you can start doing it again. So. What are some of the outcome, uh, outcomes of uh, potential scaffolds? 
William Rodkey, who's uh, uh, at Stedman Institute, uh, uh, did uh, some work with Ken DeHaven. They had 156, uh, 157 acute and 154 chronic meniscus tears treated with these CMI implants, and we're back into meniscal volume. So they did show some increased meniscal volume. If they had an acute tear, they had no difference in their functional outcomes. If it was chronic, and they did one of these implants, they seem to have some improvement in functional outcomes. Study, uh, separate study, pain activity, MRI outcomes, all improved at 10 years with, with the CMI implant. Uh, here's a uh, retrospective review of outcomes at 10 years, different, different group. Uh, no medial joint space narrowing on x-ray, MRI 65% near normal, 20% normal. So there's certainly some, something about that. This is a different group. Uh, uh, Dr. Verdonk uh, uh, uses a poly, polyurethane scaffold. In the United States, we can't use the polyurethane, so it's just a different product. But what you're going to find as you walk through his outcomes is similar types of outcomes. Fairly high percentage of uh, improved volume, some clinical improvement, um, but in terms of long-term outcomes for scaffolds, we don't really know. This is actually now a systematic review looking at all the evidence available. Every time you look at these systematic reviews, you have to be really, really careful, right? And so the, the, the best you're going to be able to conclude from a systematic review is the weakest link, which is going to be the level four studies, because this was made up of 10 level four studies, two level two studies, and only one level one study. With all of that said, they concluded that most studies show presence of meniscus-like tissue with scaffolds. Most studies demonstrated minimal degenerative joint uh, uh, pre uh, progression at relatively short follow-up. Uh, but they were generally mixed quality. Some other people have suggested mixing the last two things together, mesenchymal stem cells and scaffolds, uh, and they've shown some potential for that. So ultimately, the question with the synthetic scaffold is what is the tissue quality that's repaired? Is the MRI volume reproducible? And does it last? So how about uh, in terms of uh, synthetic scaffolds? Is it something that's really right in there, right accessible that we should be doing, following the pendulum and doing those right now. Well, there's some improvement of symptoms. Uh, there's some improvement of function. Not really sure if over the long term it prevents arthritis, but over the short term it seems to. Uh, uh, the question, of, I'm not sure if it's durable. It seems to be relatively low risk. If you do meniscus repairs, it's not that hard of a procedure to do. Uh, and while there is an implant cost, it's not terribly expensive. Certainly not as terrible as potentially uh, meniscus transplants. So has meniscus transplant, which are much more expensive, altered the pendulum swing of potentially doing replacement of, of meniscus, patho uh, of a meniscus? So we've done these a, diff a few different ways, uh, 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 long plugs, plugs on both ends to try to uh, uh, place a new, new meniscus into place. And in terms of the background of meniscus transplantation, it was first performed in the 1980s uh, with the goal of improved stability. Uh, with the goal of uh, decreasing arthritis, so we replace this contact surfaces that the meniscus was supposed to do, therefore uh, pr trying to prevent arthritis into the future. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, 2011, uh, uh, 20, uh, there's a question was, is it, I mean, if you go to the insurance companies, they'll say that meniscus transplant is experimental. Maybe you can't do it. So the challenge here in this study was to say, is it really still experimental? And the answer is we've done it long enough, we actually have some pretty good data that gives us some predictability. And they basically said that at short and long-term follow-up, there's decreased pain with meniscus transplant, there's improved joint stability, so it's accomplished two of its tasks, but 60% still have meniscus extrusion. So again, if we lose the contact surfaces because of extrusion, they're probably not going to function well over the extended long-term. And so in terms of preventing arthritis 20 years later, not been shown. So there was a consensus conference uh, that was uh, uh, performed in 2015, and they gave us some indications for potentially doing meniscus transplant. So if they have unicompartmental pain in the presence of total or subtotal meniscectomy, lateral greater than medial, then you might consider a meniscus transplantation. Uh, it can be considered as a, con a concomitant uh, procedure in ACL revisions to aid joint stability, it's because it does back up the stability because it serves as a chalk block to some degree. Uh, if the meniscus was felt to be a secondary restraint. It could be used as a concomitant procedure with articular cartilage restoration. Why? Because if you do an articular cartilage restoration, you need to take the load off of this uh, hyaline cartilage you're trying to rebuild. 
You need to have good alignment. You need to have the, the contact surfaces all to be matched. You can't have the loading forces anymore. So doing a meniscus transplant may protect your hyaline, cart hyaline cartilage reconstruction. Uh, if, it's, uh, uh, if you do it with an HTO in a meniscus def uh, deficient knee, uh, if they have significant malalignment, is something that also can be done. Um, ultimately, they've suggested that you should not perform meniscus transplants prophylactically. So I think it becomes a continued challenge with our young athletes who sit there and go, oh my gosh, I looked inside, they completely lost their meniscus. Uh, am I supposed to do a meniscus transplant right now? They don't hurt yet. I'm worried about them. We know that if you lose the meniscus, you have that focal function, they're probably going to get arthritis. But the current state of the art is not to just immediately do a meniscus transplant. You need to wait them out a little bit, prove that they start having pain, which is an interesting debate. Because when, when we have these people that start saying, they're going, OK, I've lost my meniscus. Should I go do a meniscus transplant? I'm going to wait them out. By the time they have pain, they start having hyaline, car hyaline cartilage damage. And if they have hyaline cartilage damage on both sides of the joint, now you're not supposed to do a meniscus transplant anymore. It's supposed to be contraindicated. So you have to be very, very sensitive about those athletes. Catch them as early as possible. So right when they start having pain is the, probably the best chance for intervention. Should also would not be performed if they have moderate to severe arthritis already in present, particularly arthritis on both sides of the joint, probably therefore won't work. So uh, uh, it's unclear whether tech, which techniques for, tran or for, uh, uh, for meniscus transplants work the best. Uh, it's unclear whether biologic augmentation with MSCs at the same time make a difference. Now, this is a study from uh, 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 Brian Cole uh, uh, at Rush uh, was asking the question particularly about athletes. So with our athletes, should we be doing meniscus transplantation? It's only a level four study, so it was a case series of about 13 patients. But they actually had a fairly good outcome. They had improved COOS, IKDC, and Lysholm scores. And about 77% of them were able to return to play. So not great, but uh, without the meniscus, they were going to be more painful. So how good is the evidence uh, for meniscus transplant? Mixed. Uh, so there's no real great level one studies. There's a couple level two studies, 46 level four st studies. And so the lower the level of evidence goes, you have to be very cautious about what you read because these people may be a little biased about their techniques. So in terms of meniscus transplants, does it eliminate symptoms? I think it certainly helps. Uh, uh, does it reproduce function? If it's successful, it does. Uh, does it prevent arthritis? Time is going to be able to tell us. Now, with all of these, whether it's biologic or menisc uh, meniscus transplants, some of this pendulum is how aggressive can we be? I think there's a big pendulum to say, golly, I did this procedure. I'm going to rehab them very quickly. I want, it's an athlete. I want to push them a little bit faster. You have to be very careful, though. You have to think about what the weakest link is. And so if the weakest link is the suture of the repair or the timing of the, 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 uh, the collagen actually healing into the tissues, then you need to slow the rehab until that occurs or at least do it safely. So the last challenge, and the one probably is the cross is over most, uh, for most of us uh, who are in uh, primary care or even in physiotherapists, is what about the degenerative meniscus tears? What, what is it that we're supposed to do about those? So where are you on that, on that pendulum of treating degenerative meniscus tears? So back to some interaction. You're going to answer questions for about four or five of these cases. And you're going to tell me what you're going to do. So a 40-year-old female triathlete with medial joint pain but no clicking. Images reveal a complex medial meniscus tear with no evidence of arthrosis. Uh, what do you want to do? Ice and medications, physical therapy, refer for resection, or refer for repair? OK? Biggest, biggest thing as I look around the room, everybody's voting for physical therapy. So how about this one? Same case, but now she has locking. 40-year-old female triathlete with medial joint pain with locking. Does locking change your, change your story? So now who, do you, who wants to vote now? So it's interesting. As I look around the room, just so I see you, uh, I see three different votes. So the first one, most people went with uh, physical therapy. Now the voting is very mixed. It's two, threes, and fours. I may resect it because it was a complex tear. Try to repair if it is repairable if possible. And some people still doing physical therapy. I'll challenge you with one, one challenge, is what is locking? So you're going to have your patients come in and they go, my, my knee's clicking, my knee's locking. In fact, we just was 
was deal, deal, uh, somebody here I was just seeing because they had some clicking and locking after an ACL reconstruction. So what does that mean? And I think you have to be very, very specific to understand with your patients all of these different terminologies because now we're going to actually change practice, right? Because we just, uh, for some of us in the room, I just said locking. We said mechanical pathology. Now I'm going to go a different route of treatment because I said it was mechanical or locking. Except, you know, somebody says, yeah, see, when I walk, oh, it hurts. So I, I don't want to walk because it hurts. A patient will call that locking. But actually, it's basically a pain feedback mechanism, and that's why they're not going or why they're not moving. So I think you have to very, every time, walk backwards and actually say, uh, uh, what is it that you actually meant by it? Reproduce it if possible. So that and then get them to say, okay, when I said it was locking, you mean stuck, won't move, pop, ungoes, that's locking. And they go, yeah, that's what it was. Then we're talking the same language. It was probably a mechanical popping rather than just the grinding of arthritis or something else. So be very careful about those t terms. One of the other terms for ACLs, I actually always use the term wobbles. I always thought wobbles was easy. I thought everybody understood wobbles mean my, my knee was unstable. I thought that was the simplest word that everybody's going to understand. I was so wrong. I say wobble, most people don't understand what I was talking about, so I have to go backwards and go, you mean your knee is unstable. You mean uh, they try to describe what it is to try to understand those terms. So back to a couple of our people with uh, some degenerative meniscus pathology. 40-year-old male with medial joint line pain, painful McMurray's, no mechanical symptoms, mild joint space narrowing, and he has an intersubstance meniscus tear. Okay, we're overwhelmingly back to physical therapy. So we're gonna, we, now we have to change up the story just because we have to. So uh, we, now he has mechanical pathology. True mechanical pathology, you've reproduced. He said he's locking. You said, yeah, he's actually, something's getting stuck in my knee. So he, again, minimal degenerative changes, complex degenerative meniscus tear. Interesting. So we're back to mixed, but still may, most of us at this point are looking at degenerative uh, or potentially continuing physical therapy for this guy. Uh, I think a couple of them started to say, okay, with mechanical, I'm willing to do surgery. And then finally, we get to this, this really kind of end-stage arthritis, 56-year-old woman, no locking, extruded meniscus, medial joint space narrowing, she's getting end-stage arthritis. Mostly physical therapy, one, one person's willing to do a resection for her, and how about she's got locking, but she doesn't want a total knee. Philippe is starting to nod now. He says, okay, now I'm willing to do it. Okay. Okay, so what, what, one of the other things we need to know is that as we get older, we're going to have changes in our meniscus. So this is going to be there, all, there's going to be present. So 50 to 59, tw about 20% of the meniscus, 60 to 69, uh, up to 35% of the meniscus, and 70 to 90 years old, if you get an MRI scan on them, you're going to see meniscus pathology half the time. So now we get back to our pendulum. So can a single article, we showed, we showed Arnosky's picture a while ago that said Arnosky's picture made a difference. Can a single paper redirect this pendulum in terms of treatment? Well, this was actually the original study that actually started everybody saying, golly, you crazy surgeons are doing way too much surgery on menisc a degenerative meniscus. And so mostly what they did is they actually compared sh a sham study, so they actually put poke holes in the person's knee, they shook bags of water so they thought they were actually getting some type of a procedure done, and then another group they just washed out the knee, and then finally they did a debridement. And with that study, they really found no difference in somebody who had degenerative arthritis and a degenerative meniscus tear, they had no difference in the outcome. It was actually quite interesting when they, when they did this to, to show the pictures, because they would take a picture of the person and they put a sign in front of them to say, what, which of the data? Sham surgery, uh, meniscus degener uh, de 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 uh, debridement. And they had the sign in front, but the guy couldn't see it. And they go, okay, um, how did you feel? And it says, sham surgery, didn't do anything. And the guy's going, I did great. Uh, and so uh, you couldn't really tell. But interestingly, if you talk to Mosley after that, he thought it was a very impressive study, but actually one of the things he argued was it was talking about placebo. What's the power of the placebo? And, and so that what we know is that 
if you do surgery, it's a quite a powerful placebo. So there's going to be a number of people that get better just because you did the more aggressive uh, uh, approach. So if you just give them a pill, that's a placebo one value. If you give them the hottest new pill just off the market, nobody else gets it, only you, that's a two power placebo. And then if I start doing injections, because I'm poking something into them, it's even more powerful. And finally, if you do surgery, it's the most powerful placebo that we have. So we have to pay attention to that in terms of even some of our surgical outcomes as we measure these in comparison. So now here's some of the other studies that followed up Mosley's work. Kirkley, uh, Sandy Kirkley, who uh, uh, was uh, in Canada, uh, uh, basically they did, a, they did a very nice study looking again at our uh, osteoarthritis, whether uh, scoping makes a difference. And basically they found for if they had severe arthritis, it didn't seem to make a big difference. Katz's study, 351 patients, whether they uh, had physical therapy versus arthroscopy, no, uh, they had improved Womack scores, but no significant difference between, uh, between the two groups. What's important about this study, though, is although they did that direct study, now for the physical therapy group that failed, they crossed over and did surgery, and they still had a, pretty, they had a reasonable chance of doing a positive outcome once they had surgery and they failed physical therapy. This is going to be important to know as we think about what we're going to do into the future about some of these degenerative meniscus tears. So another study uh, uh, basically shows the same types of things. This is really more focused. They included mechanical symptoms uh, uh, in the complaints, didn't define mechanical symptoms well, but basically showed no difference in outcome scores between arthroscopy and non-op treatment. Uh, finally, uh, uh, last couple, uh, uh, Herlin, 92 percent, uh, uh, 92 patients, not much difference. Some questions in terms of the quality of the studies. Ultimately, it does appear, though, that non-surgical physical therapy may be equally beneficial if no mechanical pathology is present. That becomes important in terms of if you have somebody without mechanical pathology, then per certainly starting physical therapy is probably the appropriate treatment. How about arthritis? And this is, this is the hottest new one that came out, was arthroscopic partial meniscectomy versus sham surgery uh, uh, for a degenerative meniscus tear. They did have some of these with mechanical pathology, again, finding basically no difference in outcome scores if they did surgery or didn't do surgery. So most of these now, in terms of what are you supposed to do about the, uh, the outcomes, you have to think about these very carefully. What are the inclusion criteria of each study? Uh, uh, they have varying definitions of mechanical pathology. How do you define that? What's the natural history? We know that 90-year-olds, 50% of them are going to have meniscus pathology. What is the conversion rate of non-op to surgery? You have to keep that in mind so that if we're going to do physical therapy first, that it's still okay to potentially do arthroscopy if that doesn't work. And what is the risk of doing surgery? Because you want to think about risks benefits. So who can we turn to to make some of these decisions? Uh, 2016, ESCA. Uh, had a meniscus consensus, and basically they walk through this kind of a concept here, which basically says if they have a non-locked, no huge gross mechanical pathology, painful knee, over age 35 with a degenerative meniscus tear, general pathway is to do physical therapy first. Physical therapy, non-operative, plus or minus injection for about three months. After you do that, if it works, we're all happy. If it doesn't work, it's a treatment failure. If you didn't already have an MRI, you can get an MRI. And then if they, have, if they don't have significant arthrosis, go ahead and do the arthroscopy because there's still a significant number of those people that can get better with arthroscopy following that path. If they had significant arthritis, then you can go back to a, a, an arthritis type of a treatment pl uh, plan, whether it's glucosamine, lubricant shots, or potentially uh, an arthroscopy. So the suggestion is that ultimately for those, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. That is to say, with our meniscus pathology, don't take all of those six studies or eight studies now that basically say don't do arthroscopy in patients with degenerative meniscus tears. I don't think that's really what they're telling us. I think what it's telling us is surgeons, you should probably do physical therapy first. And if that fails, then go ahead and do your arthroscopy. And here's a couple of studies that actually support that. Uh, Lamplot uh, Bone and Joint Journal, which is the British Journal of uh, uh, Sports, uh, J British Journal, uh, 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 JBJS, uh, British, um, basically showed symptomatic meniscus tears in patients with mild DJD can benefit from debridement. And another study, comparative prospective cohorts, basically showed the same. So as we kind of wind down, uh, uh, the question is how do you handle the pendulum in terms of meniscus pathology? 
My suggestion to you is to be open-minded. Uh, consider uh, a broad opportunities of different, different ways of approaching it. For me, I mean, I'm actually so open-minded that I'm looking at my own ACL uh, uh, reconstructions, recognizing that I may be causing some iatrogenic injury with the meniscus, trying to figure out how to avoid that. First, do no harm. That's, that's exactly that concept. Use the best ev evidence available, so when you read the literature, pay attention to whether it's level one evidence or level four evidence, and if you're depending on level four evidence, you need to go start to the top again and be very open-minded of what they're telling you. Can't bank on that completely. And then the other thing is consider the risk and benefit. So one of the challenges, I think, uh, uh, with the pendulum swinging towards non-operative treatment of degenerative changes, when patients hurt, and they're still hurting, and they're still hurting despite physical therapy, a little knee arthroscopy is not that big of a risk. A total joint arthroplasty, I think, is a bigger surgery. So I still think that the risk-benefit ratio at that point is not unreasonable if they failed physical therapy and they're not ready for a total joint to consider uh, a debridement. So what do we know? Meniscus is essential to load and share, prevent arthritis. Saving and repairing the functional meniscus is absolutely the key. Removing non-functional meniscus is okay, but you must leave the functional remnants as much as possible. Non-surgical trials should be the first line of treatment for non-mechanical degenerative meniscus tears. Addressing me mechanical pathology, locking, uh, is still a little bit debated. Uh, meniscus restoration tools such as mesenchymal stem cells, scaffolds are supported, but by relatively low quality evidence. A meniscus transplant appears to be effective, but in select populations. So I leave you with asking the question is, who are you on the pendulum? And try not to get wet. Any questions? <laughs>